Khan. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Happiness Journey with Dr. Dan podcast, where every journey is worth living. My name is Dr. Dan, and I'm your host for today's episode. I'm a cognitive behavior psychotherapist specializing in anger management issues, both court-appointed and private, marriage counseling, dissociative disorders, narcissistic personality disorders, depression, anxiety, dream analysis, and also provide life, business, and retirement coaching support. If you need any assistance, reach out to DMV Counseling and Therapy Services at 301-325-1550, and our website is lifecoachdanamzalag.com. Today, I'm very excited to have our podcast on season two, episode nine, a very special guest, Erin Delaya. Just like every of my past episodes, I will leave it up to the guest to properly introduce themselves as no one can do a better job. Erin, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Dan. Hi, everyone. My name is Erin Delia from Mind Me, and I am a certified intuitive lifestyle coach, massage therapist, yoga and meditation teacher, and chef. And I have started sharing my journey, not only to help others understand their own path better, but to just help others know that there is alternatives to happiness and healing in the world. Beautiful. So what happened in your own personal life, Erin? And I'm sorry, I misspelled your last name. <laughs> no, it's all right. What, what... Um, go ahead. So um, my journey started off really young. I actually had a death experience at the age of three with our family dog. We had a Great Dane and I was spinning like a little child normally does and fell face first into his sleeping open mouth and he stood up and our jaws locked. So his lower canine jaw went right through my jugular area and out the side of my face. And I had a divinely experience, a uh, spiritual experience at that point um, definitely not within the realm of my own humanity. But then when I was brought back into uh, the human experience in this body, I was strapped down for hours while they sewed up my face and I was wide awake um, just because of the location and how much blood I had lost. There was no way to medicate me into a subconscious point um, and just really unable to move. So literally all I could do was move my eyes and watch and feel. And it wasn't that there was a lot of um, pain so much as the intensity of watching and feeling what you could feel. And at that age, the mind has the ability to encapsulate itself to prevent breaking, but the body and the emotional self created its own sense of memory, its own sense of reliving it. So as I got older, uh, my family thought, oh, you know, all of the professionals at the time of the eighties, you know, we didn't have trauma care back then. We didn't really do mental health back then. And they said, oh, you know, she's going to be so young that it, you know, she's not going to remember this. It's not going to be a big deal. It's just another accident. Well, lo and behold, at six years old, I had my first seizure after cutting my finger really bad while cutting an orange or a grapefruit from my mother's uh, mother day breakfast. And before I could even get to the bathroom to put a bandaid on my finger, I had passed out and had a full on petite mal seizure and they could not explain why. And, you know, there was no uh, mental imbalance, there was no physical imbalance. And, you know, I had seen some professional psychiatrists, psychologists style doctors, but I couldn't tell them at that point, they didn't have a language to communicate what was happening. It was almost like a PTSD, but again, it was such an underdeveloped topic during those days that, you know, they just said, oh, well, it's really just anxiety and she'll learn to deal with it. You know, she'll get older, she'll deal with it. But as I got older, um, and, you know, you start having dental work as a teenager and, you, you know, shots and all those other types of things as you get older. Every time I'd come to that threshold, I'd have another seizure. And it wasn't like I was having seizures just walking or seeing too much light or too much, you know, um, noise. It was very particular to reliving that experience being strapped down on the surgery table. And so it would happen first physically, then emotionally. And then my mind would try and rationalize what was happening, but because it was so intense um, on that energy level, I just mentally could not handle it. And again, my consciousness was almost encapsulated, almost forcing the consciousness out of the body experience. And you know, you come back two or three days later when you can actually function again and have memory and you know, have to move forward. So it really shaped the arc of my life because trying to be an adult going into my twenties, trying to go to university to be a doctor myself and wanting to help heal other people, I couldn't do it. I couldn't sit through the requirements to get uh, to qualify for medical med school. 
I really couldn't handle anything from gory movies to giving blood to seeing accidents in front of me. So I hid and I ran and I disassociated from everything and I just closed myself off and I said, I'm just going to be a chef and I'm going to operate in this little world and I'm just going to live this life and I'm just going to be happy with that for what it is. And that didn't work. And at one point or another, for a lot of other life uh, circumstances, I became a massage therapist because I was going to be an at-home mom at the time. And I met a group of people who had a language and they had a path that helped me understand what I was going through every time it happened, every time because I had a seizure while I was in school. And I ended up going down the Eastern medicine rabbit hole, so to speak. I became a Reiki master because it learned, I learned how to manage and release and heal through energy work. I, you know, did a lot of the massage therapies touch to start really investigating the body release, but also breath work and um, yoga work and meditative work and became teachers in those. And those were really just all the qualifications were really happening mostly because I was exploring my own path of healing because I didn't want to have to take medication forever because, you know, that was the push from a lot of the Western world. Every time I would go to the hospital, they'd be like, oh, why aren't you on meds? And I'm like, because I don't need to be on meds because I'm not epileptic. There's no physical um, expression of my body that is having a reason for seizures that you would give this type of medicine to. It's, it's something else. And nobody had a word for it. So of course, everyone had a diagnosis or something they wanted me to do that just did not feel right to me at all. And so I kept going and I stopped avoiding and I started changing and I started redefining what living was. Um, through various teachers and various experiences. And by the time I hit 40 this year, so from 30 to 40, I've actually not had a single seizure. Um, I've had over 10 in my life um, from like six years old to 28, 29. And they all happen very randomly. But when I stopped running and I started learning how to reconnect the spirit, the mind, and the emotional and physical selves, I started to really understand what living was and how to do it fearlessly, but also how to show up on the edge of my fear and to ride that in a way of learning to grow and heal. And with that path, I decided to become a certified life coach because I wanted to help people grow through and understand there are many paths. It's all very specific to each person, but having somebody who has walked that path and, and help you walk forward and change and live and grow is a real option. And that's not something that we promote a lot right now because it's not something we can slap just a one certificate on and say, okay, you're official. Um, you know, it, it's, it's at best random and at worst it happens when you're least expecting it. And so that's been my path and I've been really happy sharing it. Wow, kudos to you, Erin. Uh, and through your uh, time that you were getting those seizures, did you, did you physically feel them coming? Or did they just kind of like hit you just when the time that you said, if you see gore, or if you are in the operation table, you're gonna be having the seizure? The, the seizures, there was no predecessing moment. Like I woke up and you felt a certain way kind of thing. So um, one of the more intense ones was the first time my sister gave birth, she had a C-section. And um, I, she needed help using the rest facility in her hospital room. And that required her to adjust all of the pads and things that she was wearing. And I saw that and I literally turned around, dropped and had a seizure. Like it's, it's so quick um, that there's no telltale signs. It's not like, you know, my body temperature changes. It's not like I become incoherent. It's really such a visceral relapse into that experience that I just instantly lose control. Wow. So how did you manage in your 30s not to have one seizure? I mean, was it because of the transformation that you went through, the spiritual transformation, or what has happened exactly? So every time I went to learn like a different style of meditation or a different style of yoga or a different style of breath work um, or energy 
you had to move that intensity through the body. You have to figure out where is it hiding, so to speak, where is it evolving um, and where is it coming through? And so I was able to walk to that intense edge. You know, the, uh, the breath work, especially because it makes you almost feel like you're hyperventilating and it, it, it recreates that level of anxiety in my body. I was able to sit there and pull all my energy up through like a Kundalini exercise and push it from my root to my crown. And that is very similar to what it feels like right before I have a seizure, like right before my consciousness just clicks right out of it. And so I was able to constantly repeat and relive and repeat and relive. In my daily life structure, I'd have a very similar pattern where my morning meditation, it's not as long or as intense as it used to be, um, allows me to do that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, growing up, there was a lot of anger from just family stuff too. sitting for 100 hours of non moving meditation, you really become very intimate with yourself and your feelings in your body and the way that they all coalesce together and they feed off of each other. And so when something would come in and would trigger me, I would relive that experience again. And so it was this constant pattern of showing up no matter what happens and putting myself in situations where I was going to experience something until the intensity started to decrease over time. Because the longer you come to that edge and you sit there and you allow the intensity to just exist the way that it is, the more you allow it, one, to release, and two, for your kind of conscious awareness connections to become stronger. And so inevitably, I became stronger than the intensity of that seizure happening, so much so that I think I was 35 or 36, and I was stuck in traffic going one direction, and traffic was going in the other direction, and a motorcyclist wiped out. And they stopped traffic in every direction. And he was laying two lanes to my left off the driver's side. And he was laying there and he's all bloody and, you know, laying on the street and his bike was in a million pieces. And I was stuck there for an hour. Wow. And so I turned off my car. I opened all my windows, even in Florida. And I just went right into my practice. I knew it was there. I saw it. I didn't have to continually trigger myself visually. I could feel it. You know, I could feel the intensity of the energy happening there. And I could hear the sirens again and I could, I went through the whole rigmarole and I just sat there and went right into it. And I let myself experience it. I didn't disassociate. I didn't drop off from the experience. I was determined that come hell or high water, I'm here for a reason. So let's do this. And wow. that's what I did. So now do you think that you've mastered the process, uh, Aaron, or you may, I mean, this, these are things like obviously the, the accident that you faced and uh, you dealt with when you were 36 but do you feel that this is with your practice of kundalini and all the other uh, uh, meditation that you've done you feel that you have mastered it or you still are a bit stressed like for example someone who has a heart attack um, they're always worried that if they go and run on a treadmill is this another episode will happen so do you always fear this episode from coming from anywhere um i don't and the reason I don't is because if it happens, it happens. And it was meant to happen for a reason. But I know that my practices prepare me for, my lifestyle prepares me for that next situation. Because I can't avoid life and what happens here in this world. Chaos is real. And you might have another episode. I might, you know, have one tomorrow. I might see something and I might not be as prepared as I thought I was, but you know what, I'm going to handle whatever I come up to because I have faith in my process and I believe in my life. And I know that these things are there to teach and learn and grow. And so the fact that I haven't had a seizure in 10 years isn't because I'm avoiding living. It's because I more firmly believe that I'm going to be able to do and live and grow and be happy from whatever comes to me more than the fear of what's going to happen next. Uh, you're a mother, you said, right? I am not. I was. I wanted to be, but um, that situation did not work out, actually. Okay, because I was thinking that if that was the case and uh, finding yourself in an operating table, that would have probably trigger another episode. So I was just wondering if you were able to master that or not. Okay. No, nope, I was not blessed with uh, a family. It's uh, just been me and my dog, so... Oh, there you go. <laughs> their family in itself, you know? Yeah. So how, when it comes to teaching others, um, your coaching and all that, 
um, what kind of like cases you come across that have that are similar to what you've gone through and how can you help those people who have gone through such a traumatic experience to be able to recover from it? Um, I have the personal more one-on-one -on -one coaching. I teach classes and I publicly speak and I do that in different ways because um, I do talk to people who've survived traumatic things, whether it's open heart surgery, cancer, um, you know, motivational speaking, all that kind of stuff, because I feel that it shows people that what they're going through has purpose and that they can get there and they just have to keep asking the right questions and, and not giving up having determination. The classes in the 101, um, one on one, sorry, uh, classes are traditional yoga and meditation relative to it, to releasing energy and experiencing life and happiness. The trauma and the coaching trauma is such a wide and various topics because there's so many things for so many people that are there to teach you something. And so people who I work with are everything from people who grew up in traumatic family experiences that really lack confidence in themselves and they wanna take their lives and their work and their art or whatever to the next level. Um, people who are spiritually minded just because there is that essence of balance that you have to come across in the healing. Um, professionals who are just looking to release anger and intensity so that they can show up in their worlds as better, not just entrepreneurs, but even you know people who classically work uh, and a day job, so to speak. Um, I'm trying to think who else. Um, a lot of entrepreneurs um, on various levels from extremely stressful lives, uh, people who do events, people who organize um, large gatherings and things of that nature, because they tend to get lost in their own stress and the anticipation of how important the environment is and how they lose touch with who they are and they get lost in those situations. And a lot of that is also resemblant from something that happened that they learned earlier on in life. And then they continue to take that pattern and adjust it and adjust it and adjust it until it no longer functions. And then they find someone like myself and they're like, well, wait a minute, I know exactly what you're talking about. How did you undo that? And that's when we work together. So this is like mostly habits that they've developed throughout the years and they need someone with your knowledge to be able to separate themselves from the past and focus more on the present, being more mindful. But if they have a toxic relationship with that past and they always think they're not good enough or they're not, uh, or like going through the imposter syndrome, always yep. think I'm not, you know, who am I to teach others if I'm not good enough myself or I don't believe in myself. So that in itself is kind of like a constant, you know, remembering what they've done in the past and how they can break from it. So I, exactly. uh, I see that your, your knowledge is extremely resourceful, um, but you know, sometimes it's very hard to see it from within. They need someone with a third eye perspective to be able to, let, to allow them to see it better. Yes, and I really like also because the, the techniques that I teach to deal with the in the moment opportunities where you are you know, being triggered or you feel like you're being pressured or to, to go back, right? To do that old pattern again. Everything I teach is in the moment and you practice it between sessions with me and you start to learn and it cultivates that level of awareness of when it's happening. It gives you something that you can use to kind of diffuse the situation so that you come back into yourself, into the present moment to be more powerful with the way that you're choosing to be you know, reactive or making that choice or taking whatever step that is. And then really looking at evolution of your life and where you're going and it not being just about that next person, place or thing on your bucket list, but really about living in a state of being mentally, physically, emotionally, that's happy. And that way you kind of fill your cup, so to speak, so that everything around you you know, is attracted to that and is in sync with that. Wow. Have you ever faced cases where you can say, I can't help you? Or absolutely. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, part of that is also saying that some people's traumas are addictive and that they need a different style of help. Okay. Um, you know, sometimes on the mental health border, there are so many things that someone like myself can help someone with, but at some point, when you can tell that the client is really ingrained in it, they're not going to see the path out. You have to refer to somebody else like yourself, you know, who's got the qualifications on that level to just be like, okay, 
I've got a different path for you to take. Maybe I have a medication at the moment that'll help diffuse the situation so you can grow beyond, um, you know, because those things are really real um, and you can't discount somebody else's experience by just saying, oh, well, my program doesn't work for you. It's not how it works. Do you have any like uh, natural products that will help people like either better concentrate or uh, that, you know, like plants or anything of that sort that is more uh, homeopathic than all the chemical crap that there's out there. <laughs> yeah, um, and, and I think it's, you know, I call it the intuitive uh, breakthrough boot camp and intuitive lifestyle living because I think everybody's a little bit different. So whether, you know, you can handle scents and you can do lavenders and you can have these plants in your house. Um, you know, I keep a lot of aloe around because it produces a lot of oxygen at night and it scrubs the air in my house. It's also mostly water. So it has like a higher frequency just in general, um, that eating healthy, being happy is a state of your choosing. Correct. And so whether you can handle sense or you can do, you know, CBDs, or you can do these things when your body's intensity, it also comes back to, you know, do you wake up every morning? Do you check in with yourself? Are you honest with yourself about where you're really at today? And you use that as the leverage to how the day is going to go, whether you're going to reorganize it, or you're going to, you know, show up being really powerful, um, and taking self-care time, take off your shoes, go outside and walk in the grass. Mm -hmm. A lot of those little or simpler things um, are actually more powerful than we give them credit for because we think that they're woohoo and, you know, they might as well be as, uh, you know, childish, so to speak, because children do them. But in all honesty, they work a lot better than um, really taking any kind of you know, um, CBD or, you know, just doing those lavenders because in the end, those are still band-aids. Mm -hmm. So if you're eating a lot of peppermint or you're, you're smelling a lot of lavender, or you're, you know, taking a lot of medication that's still letting you float through the situation without actually experiencing it. And so you're not getting that signal of maybe I need to step back and maybe I need to reframe, maybe I need to decide whether or not this is actually good for me. And so you got to be really careful about when and where you choose to use those things. And that's kind of why I like to do some of the meditations and the breaths and the movement as treatments for moments rather than products, because products can get to that edge of you not recognizing when you're blowing past it. And then you've got a whole different such situation of needing to rewind and restart. That's actually a very good point you, uh, you mentioned there. Um, so what kind of like meditation would you say uh, would work for the majority of people? Um, you mentioned about Kundalini exercise, like breathing exercise. Do you find that one would work better than the other, Erin? My favorite course, like core that I teach is, um, and it sounds the scariest, it's the non-moving breath meditation. And so I ask people to get into just a uncomfortable chair sitting down, feet flat on the ground, hands in the lap, right? And to you know, close your eyes and just consign yourself after you've set your timer. So nice little pleasant timer on your phone or your tablet or whatever, that's got a nice ring to the end of it. Nothing egregious because you don't want to wake up and so to speak and be angry at it. Um, but you know, set it for five to 10 minutes and get into the feeling of the sensations of breathing in and out through the nose it has a very specific sensation. Everybody feels one of them very well. And what that does is, is you can't breathe in the past. You can't breathe in the future. You have to breathe in the present moment. And if you don't breathe in the present moment for more than about a minute or two, you're probably not living anymore. So in that way, you're practicing giving yourself life. You're practicing releasing what doesn't honor you and you're practicing being present in the moment. So in a five to 10 minute meditation, you can let all of the chaos of what's in your head and your emotions and your physical and your environment go on and choose to walk away back to the sensation of breath. It's not that it's gonna disappear, but it is gonna get you back to that point of, I'm just breathing, I'm just grateful to be here breathing. I'm just gonna feel this, I'm gonna let the intensity come down a little bit on its own. And then once my alarm goes off, I'm gonna step back and I'm gonna look at everything. And it's just automatically different because you're not looking at it from uh, rosy colored glasses or a point of anger, you're looking at it from the middle. And that that is really powerful. So every time you stop and choose to do five minutes of 
close your eyes, just sink into your breath and walk away from everything that's going on, you're actually training yourself to be powerful in how you show up. Beautiful. So tell our listeners, uh, Aaron, how they can find uh, you online. Uh, you mentioned Instagram. And uh, so at least those who actually are lost in their, their breathing, <laughs> they can actually contact you and uh, get your help. So uh, the easiest place to find me is uh, AaronDelia.com. And so that just you can get me directly. You can contact me. You can call me. You can email me. I'm on Instagram, Facebook as Mind Me, spelled M-E-E-E, because -E -E, uh, it stands for Empower, Elevate, and Evolve, which are the three steps that I use in a lot of my teaching. I am also on LinkedIn under Erin Delia, um, and I'm sure that Dan, Dr. Dan will have the uh, correct spelling of my name so that you can all find me. And I think I'm on YouTube as well. So if you wanted to just have some of my free courses, classes, and discussions, about you know awareness and trauma and grief and how to do some of these breathing exercises or writing exercises that I teach. They're all right there. My channel name is again, Erin Delia. Try to keep it pretty simple. Beautiful. I'm actually gonna put this uh, podcast also on YouTube. So I'm gonna tag you there as well. So people Thank you. listen to the show, they'll be able to just click on the tag and find you directly. Awesome. I really appreciate it. It's been fun talking with you. Absolutely. So that's basically the time that we have for today's uh, podcast. I really do appreciate you, Aaron, for taking the time out of your very busy schedule to join us. Thank you again for participating and inspiring our many listeners with your incredible story. Now, we hope that you have all enjoyed today's episode, and I'm very excited about the many upcoming guests that we have scheduled for season two of the Happiness Journey podcast, filled with inspirational stories, just like the one that you listened to today. Now, here are a few concluding words of wisdom. Identity is a prison you can never escape from. But the way to redeem your past is not to run from it, but to try to understand it and use it as a foundation to grow. Learn to never compare your results to someone else's. You can never be that other person. You can only become a better version of yourself. If you're looking at what you have accomplished in life and not be happy about it, make that change. Focus on your personal goals and make sure you do whatever it takes to not deter from these goals. These are your dreams. Protect them. My name is Dr. Dan Amzalag, and you may all keep pursuing your amazing journey in life.